I say a couple things about the group before I, oh, is there a bit of static? Yeah, well, just let me know. Um, before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Noemi Merleau-Ponty, who will be introducing our very distinguished speaker tonight. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's a lot of static, isn't there? Um, can you hear me if I don't use the mic? Okay. Um, so the Reproductive Sociology Research Group is uh, based in the Department of Sociology. Um, it began in 2012, um, and the objective of the group is really to put reproduction at the center of social analysis and to um, see what difference that makes to our understanding of social life, to have reproduction at the center of how we understand the economy, how we understand uh, the nation and nationalism, how we understand race, how we understand gender, kinship, modernity, how we understand the environment, really how we understand all of the topics we address in the social sciences and beyond, because when reproduction is placed at the center, the view changes. Um, we've had a series of um, funded research grants since 2012. They have supported the work of the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, Reprosoc, um, and we currently have a very large grant from the Wellcome Trust to study um, changing perceptions of fertility and infertility worldwide. Um, so this is a very large qualitative study of changing perceptions of fertility and infertility worldwide with a network of 34 partners in 16 different countries. So it is the largest qualitative study ever undertaken of changing perceptions of infertility and fertility and how those changing perceptions of reproduction are manifest in changes to other kinds of behavior. Um, it's a real privilege to be undertaking this project at Cambridge, um, which has a unique concentration in the area of reproduction and which for many, many years has had an increasingly powerful uh, scholarly um, contribution to the field that we could now call reproductive studies. Um, there is now here at Cambridge um, a strategic research initiative in reproduction that's a university um, uh, sponsored um, um, network of um, researchers working in this area who now have the benefit of an administrator who can help us to um, bring our ideas together across the disciplines more effectively. Um, and this is an especially important um, subject as at this time, as fertility is the subject of an increasing amount of attention. Um, this is our fifth annual public lecture, the fifth Reprosoc annual public lecture. The first was given by Emily Martin in 2015, mm -hmm. um, the second by um, Professor Marcia Inhorn in 2016, the third by Rosalind Pachewski um, in 2017, the fourth by uh, Karis Thompson in 2018, and this year we are thrilled to be welcoming Anandita Majumdar from um, India to be speaking us with us tonight on the subject of her research. And it's such a delight to welcome you to Cambridge. Your work has been so influential to all of us. Thank you. Uh, it's a really wonderful occasion for the fifth annual public lecture to have Reprosoc and Reproduction SRI. And I'm going to turn it over to Noemi Merleponti to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Lara. Um, if I don't uh, speak loud enough, please just, you know, like uh, wave and I'll, I'll just try to raise my uh, my tone. Um, I want to uh, thank Marcin and Sarah for this great honor um, that you are giving me today of introducing uh, Professor Anidinta Majumdar, who's coming uh, from uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in Hyderabad today. Um, so Anindita Majumdar has been working on commercial um, uh, surrogacy, kinship and infertility since 2010. Um, she has a book that is really um, uh, wonderful on that topic uh, that was recently uh, published in 2017 called Transnational Commercial Surrogacy and the uh, Unmaking of Kin um, in, in India. And I will uh, circulate the book for you if you want to have a quick look. I just ask that I get it back at the end. <laughs> um, 
So, um, actually, when I was trying to, to prepare this uh, presentation, I, I, I um, realized that I had encountered um, Anidita Mackenzie's work quite early in my own academic trajectory, um, as I did a review of a book on uh, commercial surrogacy in India called Outsourcing Life, where she has a chapter. And I remember vividly that I was um, quite attracted by the fact that she had an angle that was quite surprising uh, and, 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 and appealing, um, which was the notion in that chapter of bureaucracy and visas. Uh, and, and that focus on institutional technologies really um, um, uh, made me curious about, about knowing more about her work. Um, and it's actually a, to a topic that's extremely important in her book. Uh, and I will, uh, of course, not summarize the book here, but just highlight um, one aspect that I find particularly uh, interesting um, from uh, the perspective of my um, interests around biology, technology, and institutions. She focuses on biology as an information technology in discussion uh, with new kinship studies. And she asks, um, or the way I understand it, uh, what does it mean um, to study uh, biology as an information technology? And more, in, in, and more importantly, um, how is it practiced in a North Indian context? So kind of bringing debates that were you know, shaped um, uh, outside of the Indian context and see, so what, what do we see? What do we um, understand when we bring that to the North Indian context? And in that book, the, fo the, the focus on the role of bureaucracy is extremely important. We uh, hear about visa officers, lawyers, medical doctors. Um, and then uh, in that uh, context, transnational commercial surrogacy becomes a case uh, to look at the conceptualization of biology in India. And uh, one of the conclusions of that uh, book is that um, the conceptualization of biology in relationship with new kinship studies create this idea of conflicted kinship. Um, conflicted kinship could encapsulate this idea of frictions between different understandings of what biology means um, in the specific cases she studies. Uh, what biology means at an intellectual level for reproductive scholars, but also more importantly, um, at the level of practice. Uh, and she shows quite clearly that sometimes we have frictions and tension and conflicts at the intellectual level, but that it can work out in practice and that uh, things can work out, kinship can work out through practice and daily routine of making it work through negotiation and care. Um, and that's a really beautiful way of showing also how academic work um, uh, can stay very humble and modest in its approach of the phenomena uh, it's studying and kind of, you know, of claiming respect for the practice that we are studying. And I just wanted to highlight um, how elegant your book is it in that uh, respect. So uh, Anindita has also uh, recently contributed to a book um, um, called Oxford India Short Introduction Series on Surrogacy. Um, she is also completing a fieldwork on reproductive slavery and reproductive justice in the context of commercial surrogacy as part of a collaborative research project with the University of Stockholm and Uppsala, funded by the Swedish Research Council. And uh, she is also at the moment working uh, on um, the linkages between aging and assisted reproductive technologies in India and um, especially the biological clock funded by a Wellcome Trust um, grant and also a grant from the Indian Council for Social Science Research. So without further ado, um, I um, welcome Anindita to the floor to hear about that recent research. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Sarah. Um, can you hear me at the back? Um, I, I am deeply humbled to be here. It's an affirmation of a lot of things. It's 
Uh, it's a belief I have in my work. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to Sarah, to Naomi. Thanks. Thanks, Marcel. Um, I want to thank Lucy. Uh, we started out last year at, at a conference on the same theme in India. Um, I want to thank Sarani for making it here all the way. And thanks to a few of my students who've come from India. Thank you all for coming here today. Uh, in case you can't hear me, please indicate as much. Um, so I'm going to um, speak a little and read a little. Uh, in this paper, I'm primarily looking at the conceptualization of aging and assisted reproductive technologies and their linkage uh, through the perspective of uh, the idea of statistics, data, and through how aging and being aged comes undone in the Indian context. Uh, the focus is specifically on one small town in North India and one uh, and where I'm based in South India, Hyderabad. Uh, I do a comparison of the data I have gathered in these two places, which may, which is right now it's work in progress. So it's at a rudimentary stage, but I'm trying to work through uh, the conceptualization and the idea of how data can be used to understand uh, larger ethnographic questions that emerge from the field. Um, so in, in looking at how uh, reproduction and aging and assisted reproductive technologies uh, come undone. Um, I actually look at three uh, different aspects. One is at the National Family Health Survey data, uh, which is, uh, a, a, you know, it's taken every decade by the government of India, and it maps household uh, health, it looks at fertility rate, it looks at contraceptive use, and it's primarily focused on population control in India. Um, along with that, I look at my small data as well, to look at questions of fertility and how the body may be imagined within such a space. Um, I also look at the, the question of how uh, aged and aging are manufactured within IVF practice. Uh, it is a, a very potent tool for IVF doctors to work with. So the idea of the biological clock becomes even more complicated when couples approach doctors for treatment for infertility and how then doctors create a discourse which affects not only the treatment but also the popular discourse on uh, bodies and aging and decline. Um, an important part of this conversation is what I'm trying to kind of conceptualize as temporal inevitability. It's still at a uh, rudimentary your basic stage, but in another article I wrote on infertility, uh, I talked about temporal inevitability in relation to chronicity. And I suggest that both assisted reproductive technologies and a particular kind of discourse in India are championing the idea that ultimately uh, reproductive bodies are declining uh, and they're declining faster than what they're supposed to decline you know, in terms of a temporal progression. So temporal inevitability works through uh, women uh, continuously going to the infertility clinic to overcome their declining or in decline fertility. And uh, that, is, that makes their bodies uh, chronic, that, that makes their uh, use of the technology part of their chronicity. And it, it captures the sense of time which is um, constantly fraught for those who approach uh, treatment. Uh, the other idea that I'm exploring in this paper is through uh, fertility rates, through, uh, through the idea of aged and aging. And finally, the very potent idea of marital commitment. So marriage is a very important uh, trope within infertility treatment in India. It is obviously an um, unfortunately heteronormative but it carries with it a certain uh, notion of uh, time and decline and commitment uh, that impacts infertility treatment. And I want to discuss how doctors use it, IVF specialists and embryologists use it, use it with, to create success uh, to actually promote uh, the idea of reproductive decline and the biological clock. Um, 
So before I, before I, uh, uh, before I go any further, I want to talk about my field sites because there are there are three field sites which are very particular in their character. In 2016, I worked, uh, I was teaching in Southern India in a university and uh, it, the characteristic of the university was that it was, it's peculiar to India. It was a small university town, which is uh, not found replicated anywhere else in India. And the university had a hospital uh, and the hospital had a very well-known IVF clinic. Uh, I have used a pseudonym here uh, for the place Raja Nagar because um, that was the only clinic in that area. So it had a lot of influence. Um, and uh, I, I was asked to anonymize. Uh, and the clinic uh, had a particular personality. It catered to a lot of um, couples in and around. Um, and I'll, I'll actually come to that. The other place was in North India where I did field work last year uh, in a small town called Hisar in the North Indian state of Haryana. Um, and uh, So um, Hisar ha has a population of three lakhs um, and 300,000 people. And uh, it's, a, it's a really small uh, city. It's not even, it's a town. And it's part of a state which has a overt, uh, toxic, masculine, patriarchal culture. It's known as, it's part of the Northern Belt in India, which is known for its toxic masculinity and is identified as such, largely because of a deficit in female sex ratio, because a lot of women, or girl children or female fetuses don't make it uh, to birth. They are, uh, there are a lot of female, uh, there's female feticide, which has taken on alarming proportions to the point that a law was enacted in India to curb the practice. Uh, it's also known for honor killings where young women who may marry outside the community are killed off um, with absolutely, and it's, it's mandated by community uh, groups called cops, which are ruled and governed by older men. And uh, so the, the dynamics of the state, it's largely portrayed as a negative space. Currently, actually, because of a horrendous rape from the city where I am currently in Hyderabad, a lot of old conversations are being revived about patriarchy in the North as well. And one of the videos, you can actually watch it online, talks about how uh, the culture in Haryana specifically promotes rape, where a lot of men talk about women asking for it. So uh, that within that milieu, uh, reproductive technologies have a huge amount of power because they're used, first of all, the sonography, the sonograph is used to detect uh, female fetuses, which then are then aborted. And uh, they're also, uh, the assisted reproductive clinic works very well there because preconception, uh, sex determination is practiced surreptitiously. There's no proof that it's there, but through conversations, one gets a feeling that this is something that clinicians practice. Um, in that space, I was, I was actually, I did field work in a clinic where the doctor was known as a rogue doctor because he facilitated assisted reproduction amongst women over 60. Um, I am a little cautious of using the term postmenopausal because I'm in the process of actually looking at that term and looking at menopause. So I'm gonna use the age marker uh, to identify uh, why the doctor was rogue. And uh, uh, he actually facilitated, uh, the, the last big birth that he facilitated was for a 70 year old woman who uh, gave birth to a baby boy in 2017 or 18. Um, and uh, so there is a lot of criticism and I worked in that clinic specifically to track uh, that particular demographic. Um, and in my second field site was Hyderabad, which is where I work and I'm based. Um, Hyderabad is a big metropolis. Uh, it has many IVF clinics. It has, it has a very old Islamic culture, um, but it also has 
Now, currently, Hyderabad is known in, is known in India as the IT hub. So there are Google, Facebook, uh, all the major information technology conglomerates have head offices there. And it's got a huge population of young uh, startup entrepreneurs, as well as people who work in, uh, in IT, you know, in these IT companies. And they, they became one of the major, they are actually identified as one of the major clients of IVF clinics. So it's a very interesting demographic, but I'll, as we go into the paper, we'll see how that's not really true. So it's, it's a young city and it also has a particular culture, but it's at the cusp of this huge IVF industry, as I like to call it. Uh, there's also surrogacy in Hyderabad, which is very problematic because recently uh, uh, the Hyderabad High Court actually came down very heavy on a particular clinic for imprisoning surrogates for nine months in a hostel uh, and not letting them out or having a control over their diet. So uh, it's, an, it's pending in court right now. So uh, it's, it's an interesting space for that kind of work in terms of infertility. Um, and finally, uh, the university town uh, is particularly, was particularly interesting because I actually got access to the IVF process to open pick up, which, you know, is very difficult to navigate in, in ethnographic research of the lab or of the clinical space, but I was given access to that. Uh, the interesting thing about Raja Nagar that I want to flag is that a lot of women who came, uh, so it's, uh, it's part of this, larger uh, district which has maritime trade and it's a big fishing hub. Uh, so a lot of women who came to the clinic uh, would come with, actually I couldn't meet the husbands because I wasn't allowed. Many of the men didn't want to talk. Many of them were absent. And uh, there is a practice of visiting husbands because most of the husbands were on ships and they would be traveling for long lengths of time or they were, their husbands would be working in the Gulf as skilled labor in the Middle East, which meant that they wouldn't come often. They would probably come once in two years for 15 days, uh, which had a very important impact on family making and on fertility and infertility. A lot of women came there because they were unable to actually have sex with their husbands or they had sex at times when conception wouldn't occur. So there was there were other problems associated, and this was peculiar to uh, Raja Nagar. Uh, it was not something I found in Hisar or in Hyderabad. Hisar was primarily agrarian, Hyderabad was a city. So there are three different spaces that came together, that actually come together in my ethnography here. Try to make meaning of what, what is infertility and how IVF technology makes sense of age and infertility in these three spaces. Okay, um, just to briefly kind of place my research in a theoretical space, um, uh, I, there is a lot of work on the biological clock and reproductive decline in terms of the Western notion of, uh, you know, assisted reproduction and also how you're headed towards a particular kind of decline as work by Carrie Fries. Uh, there is a work by uh, uh, Robert Nashtigal on how the biological clock is a very important trope in infertility treatment. Sarah Franklin has spoken about family planning and planning for the family, which is also temporally understood. Uh, and uh, I also place my theoretical understanding within what Margaret Locke speaks of in terms of denaturalizing aging and how aging itself as it's understood within Western medicine and how it's, it comes apart in cultural understanding in her work on menopause, menopause in Japan and US is, is interesting to look at uh, how our bodies decline, how our bodies decline reproductive, how our reproductive bodies decline differently or how it's understood differently. Uh, but uh, Caroline Bledsoe's work has influenced uh, my research to a great deal as she talks about the tolls and tribulations that women in Gambia go through in making meaning of their reproductive temporality. Uh, and those tolls and tri tribulations are part of the larger conversation on how 
lived experiences are often not part of medical discourse or understanding. And, with, and there is this constant negotiation that ethnography undertakes to bring in the lived experience into uh, research on medicine or clinical research or clinical practice. Um, so I, in case of, and, and in extension of this, of course, I, um, I've also done, I've also looked at how age and aging and reproductive decline come to be understood in the Indian context, in the South Asian context. So for instance, Sarah Lam's work is um, equally important to understand how uh, women in India post-menopause actually become men, or are, that's the wrong way, they be, they, they're degendered because they take on more powerful positions and menopause actually frees them from their reproductive responsibilities. But this only happens if you are the mother of sons, not otherwise. So if you're a mother of sons, then the power and the prestige that comes with aging is, is phenomenal. It comes with having daughters-in-laws, daughters-in-law who work for you, who, who are at your service and who honor you. And within the joint family, the aging woman has a lot of power. Uh, but there's also work uh, by Lawrence Cohen on how aging in modern India is becoming a pathological condition for the joint family because increasingly families are unable to take care of their aging parents. And as per a modern script, they are moving away from what was mandated in a traditional joint family setup where you did take care of your aging parents. And that intergenerational contract in contemporary India is slowly falling apart. So um, within that space, I started to actually look at the data I had, which is from a small group of people, to understand what do numbers say about fertility and infertility. Please, uh, I mean, this is work in progress again. So it's it's thinking through uh, how, how statistics can understand uh, fertility and fertility. So I'll start reading and uh, I'll, I'll try to be slow. So Reproduction and its linkages with limited time is an important part of medical and anthropological engagements and comes to be framed through age and aging. However, the conceptualization of temporal vicissitudes on reproduction seem to be limited to the process of circumventing infertility through IVF. Thus, the turn towards incorporating a time frame to reproduction would include an, an engagement with demographic data. Con conversations within demography continue to be centered on fertility, which is positioned again on the female body. In order to fully engage with the ways in which age and infertility come to be marked in India, I engage with select demographic data. In India, demographic data has looked at declining fertility trends, especially in relation to Southern India since the 1980s. According to Leela Vizaria, this is an outcome of different factors, including an aggressive state policy that promoted contraception and maternal health care, as well as a cultural stance that does not differentiate between boys and girls, thereby avoiding a son, son preference culture and female feticide. Um, in associated work by Cecilia Van Hollen, uh, there is a discussion on how family planning is part of a script of modernity. So women in South India actually willingly went uh, to get their tubes dyed because they wanted to be modern and part of the script of a national script. They wanted to be citizens of India. So a lot of poor women willingly uh, volunteered to be part of family planning camps that still happen. Um, in the absence of the sun preference trend, demographers such as K.L. Nagaraj have pointed out that the low fertility rate in places like Andhra Pradesh and South India before it was split into two with the formation of Telangana in 2014, is due to the decline in the number of children being born during the reproductive span of a woman. This is particularly important considering all other factors demographically seem to favor a high fertility rate in Andhra Pradesh, including low age at marriage for women and very little birth spacing between the children. Just a note here, uh, Hyderabad is the capital of the state Telangana, which was before 2014 a part of Andhra Pradesh. 2014, Andhra Pradesh was bifurcated and became Telangana, and Hyderabad, which was earlier capital of Andhra Pradesh, became a capital of Telangana. Slightly complicated political trajectory, but very important uh, to place the food bank. Um, I take select data from the National Family Health Survey, NFHS, conducted every decade by the government of India, both at the regional state level 
regional and state level, and at the national level to focus on total fertility rates for the regions where our field sites are located. Here the focus is specifically on Telangana and Haryana as atypical regions in the north and south. Uh, Telangana and ex Andhra Pradesh is atypical because it also was part of the southern demographic uh, decline in total fertility rate. Um, Hyderabad is the capital of Telangana and was the capital of Andhra Pradesh before the bifurcation in 2014. Hisar is an important town in the state of Haryana. Uh, due to limited data gathered from Rajanagar and its particular culture of a university town, I have not included a discussion of the state to which it belongs, which is Karnataka. Nonetheless, Rajanagar appears in the discussion of, the, of data gathered from my fieldwork. The NFHS provides important clues to the markers of fertility in India, age, age of marriage, and rural-urban differences. Besides these data, the NFHS also provides data on information and access to contraceptives and the level of education amongst women and men in particular regions. I have taken particular elements of the NFHS data round four, which was conducted in 2015-16 at the All India level, along with that of Haryana and Telangana, to present an image of how fertility and age are imagined regionally and nationally in demographic data. The citing of infant mortality also links uh, links us to the idea of how live births become important nodes of channeling infertility in relation to fertility as subsequent sections will show. So, okay. Uh, so, this is the NFHS. As, tab as table one suggests, the age of marriage for women in Telangana is still lower than the national average of 19. Interestingly, Haryana, known for its patriarchal culture that promotes early marriage for women, clocks in at a little higher than the national average. In Andhra, where patriarchy is perhaps marginally less entrenched as compared to Haryana and North India, early marriages at the legally acceptable age limit of 18 for women were the norm in the NFHS data from the earlier round, 2005 and 6, before the bifurcation happened. But fertility rates remain higher in the north compared to Telangana, again reflecting upon the fewer children per women model. Within all this, the last discussion or last available discussion of NFHS data regarding childlessness in India is from round three in 2005-06, which clocks it at 1.85% amongst women married between 20 to 49 years and married for more than five years. Most of these women were married at below 18 years of age and, uh, and a majority lived in rural areas, around 68%, while around half of these women were uneducated. The aging enterprise, as Estes calls it, is equally potent in IVF, where fears of decline are generated to forecast aging and overturn it at the same time. In IVF, population aging, uh, according to Crampton, takes on new meaning that needs more scrutiny and engagement. Here, policy discourse in India is absolutely ab is, uh, quiet, is, is quiet in its engagement with the fears of childlessness and its impact on aging bodies. Such an imaginary does not exist in a culture obsessed with fertility rates. Infertility thus has to be marked in different ways. I attempt the same through limited data gathered from Hisar, Hyderabad, and Rajan. Oh. So this is the data from my fieldwork. Uh, please note that uh, the average years of marriage for men is uh, slightly uh, complicated because first of all, uh, men in Hisar, many of the men in the data had more than one marriage. And a lot of the men who frequented the clinic in Hyderabad, which is, so I worked in two clinics, a women's clinic and a men's fertility clinic. A lot of the men who came to Hyderabad were African men. Actually, half the data consists of African men. And many of them had more than two marriages. Some had three to four. Uh, so this data is a little um, complicated. Also, uh, the same goes for uh, the average, uh, sorry, yeah, average years of marriage, so yeah, I said that, sorry, Hyderabad and Hisar because of the polygamous nature of marriages. Um, the average age at first marriage for women interviewed in Hyderabad was 22.65 years. This is from my data. While for women at the Hisar clinic was a very low 15.5 years. 
Please note that the average age at marriage was calculated for women between the ages of 20 to 55 years in Haryana and between 20 to 45 years in Hyderabad. While NFHS data suggests a higher age at marriage for women in Haryana, my data in the Hisar clinic suggests a lower age than the national and state average. I know this is a very small number of, uh, uh, of respondents, but it's to kind of reflect through what kind of conversation the NFHS can have in relation to my data. Um, a majority of the clientele comes from other parts of the country. Nonetheless, the age range remains higher in the ethnographic data than in the NFHS round four data. This is an important takeaway from the comparison of the two tables. While in case of Hyderabad, the women exhibited a higher age at first marriage than the national and regional average, the age at marriage for men in both Hyderabad and Hisar was difficult to map due to first, lack of clarity regarding age and marital years, and second, due to the practice of polygamy amongst men in Hisar and African men in Hyderabad. Close scrutiny of the above data shows that the age range in Hyderabad of infertile couples visiting is significantly lower than those in Hisar and Rajanagar. This impacts the years of marriage as well. However, uniformly, there's a gap in the age between spouses, suggesting that husbands are older than wives across India, whether in the south or in the north. This combines cultural preferences and the legal age of marriage. For women, the legal age of marriage in India is 18, and for men, it's 22. Additionally, at the Hisar clinic, a majority of the couples were pregnant around 14 or had already given birth, that's around three, through IVF. Whereas in Hyderabad, this figure was very low amongst the women interviewed, just two. And in Rajanagar, none of the women interviewed were pregnant or had been pregnant before through IVF or normally. What does the exercise of mapping fertility data with infertility data from a microcosm generate? Hopefully, this exercise points towards a concerted need for wider quantitative mapping of assisted conception and its access amongst Indian men and women. Crucially, though vastly different in sample size and reach, tables one and two sorry, it's really small, uh, are compared to show some important trends in thinking through fertility rate and its mapping. Age, aging, and marriage have an important impact on how infertility and fertility correlate. We look at how in the following sections. Okay. So I'm going to look at temporal inevitability. My conceptualization of temporal inevitability through two lenses. Once, one is the conceptualizing of the aging and the aged. Alexandra Crampton asks of a respondent, who is old, in ascertaining the question surrounding age and aging. While I didn't specifically ask such a question in the field, the notion of age came undone in specific ways in my ethnography. This is especially important when seen in relation to how there are no age markers for a range within which IVF can be administered. Only a limit is defined of a cumulative 100 years for the couple, thereby making it accessible to those who are in their 20s or early 30s, or also in cases where the husband may be older but the wife young. So the Indian Council of Medical Research which drafts the law for assisted reproductive technologies in India, suggests that the cumulative age of the couple has to be 100 to access IVF. While explicitly looking at the identification of aging bodies in terms of the reproductive lifespans of men and women, IVF specialists in India also visualize a time frame that is most fertile to obvious failure. Thus, the limits of reproductive fertility are contingent upon factors other than disease to the tolls and tribulations of one's lifespan. These tolls and tribulations, as Bledsoe calls it, are defined by factors such as late marriages and economic pursuits, often engaged with modern living and its trappings. This is especially evident in conversation with IVF specialists and obstetricians in Hyderabad and gynecologists in Hyderabad. So uh, one of my respondents, Dr. Reddy, who, was, who ran the men's infertility clinic said, I wish couples uh, seeking fertility treatment would, co would come to me for treatment after a year and a half of being married. Instead, most couples come after five years of trying, which delays their chances of conception even further. This is particularly problematic if you're already in your 30s. I don't expect them to come in the first year of their marriage, as that does not qualify as infertility, but after a year and a half would be ideal. Uh, Dr. Maithili, who, was in, who ran the women's fertility clinic, uh, had something very interesting to say about women in their 20s who were coming to her to freeze their eggs. 
So what they're doing is they're coming in their late 20s or early 30s and freezing their eggs. We have not had people come back for it because it's only a recent norm, isn't it? With Google, um, that is the past last year, I'm thinking. So Google and Facebook um, were supporting or were giving incentives to uh, their women staff to freeze their eggs. And that was also being offered in India, in the India offices. It's such a strange thing for girls to come and freeze their oocytes, but because it was made possible by Google, we have a lot of girls coming in for that. I'm thinking they won't come before a decade because they're in their early 20s and early 30s. And when we talk to them, most don't even have their partners. They're not even seeing anybody. But they're very smart girls who knew what they were doing in terms of their careers. So I like that. Dr. Maithili is an anomaly, anomaly amongst practicing IVF specialists and obstetricians who largely espouse the need to adhere to a time frame to not only produce through sexual reproduction, but also through IVF. There are, uh, I mean, women are often abused in India. This is common. Women go to OBGYNs who often berate them for delaying reproduction. And uh, they're often told, if they're not married, you're told, you know, when are you going to get married? Because your biological clock is ticking. And if you go for infertility treatment after 30, you are, you are told summarily that you've made very wrong choices in your life. So there is actually a list of OBGYN circulating uh, in, amongst feminist groups in India, which lists uh, OBGYNs who are understanding and kind to women patients in India. Um, the aging and the aged are two sides of the same coin in assisted reproduction in India. The couple that visits the IVF clinic in their mid-30s is already aging. The post-35-year-old woman is aged. But the post-60 woman who gets pregnant through IVF is similar to the middle-aged middle -aged 35 year old seeking ERTs. So Dr. Rajesh at the Hisar Clinic, the rogue doctor, continued to assert that the level of pathology amongst elderly pregnant women was the same as that found amongst middle-aged women during pregnancy. I quote him here, the pregnancy in an older woman mimics the same forms of mortality as the middle-aged woman. Thus, the clinical outcomes for women in their 60s are similar to those in their 40s. Nonetheless, age is a marker here of forms of abnormality that the already aberrant may generate. In such a context, it is important to note that discussion changes drastically to create markers of the normal, abnormal, aberrant, and the monstrous or monstrosity within IVF practice. Taking congruilum as my starting point, the three categories overlap to eventually normalize the ways in which normalize the ways in which aging in IVF practice emerges as a dynamic concept. I purposely use the values attached to the conceptualization of these con concepts to briefly understand how medicine creates value around the idea of reproduction and bodies that can may or may not reproduce. Here, age acts as the signifier for each value. However, age is not just a number, but a process as well as a moment. In that sense, the categories of the normal, aberrant, and mon the monstrous or monstrosity may ch constantly interchange just as Congoilum conceptualizes them. Thus, the aged exhibit monstrosity uh, in the identification as birthing parents. The, mon the monstrous is marked in the physicality of the birth children. If you, I don't know if you can see it. Um, in the, of the birth children and of the parents. In newspaper reports on the birth of children to IVF amongst women who are aged, especially between the ages of 60 to 70, the mother and her children are symbolized through markers of debility and decline. Often the father, now recently the father's also been marked like that. In a recent reporting of a 73-year-old woman who gave birth to twin girls in a place close to Hyderabad, the horror of the event was continuously channelized through the depiction of debility, especially in the expected fears of death related to elderly parenting. I quote a, a few lines from the newspaper. The husband of a woman aged 73 who is thought to have become the world's oldest mother after giving birth to twin girls through IVF suffered a stroke just a day after his daughters were born. In other representations, elderly women who give birth through IVF are eventually marked through their aberrant bodies that are unable to take the pressures of childbirth. I quote a few lines again from a newspaper. Uh, an Indian woman, woman who had a baby in her 70s has said that being a mother is harder than she thought it would be. 
Daljinder Kaur said her health had deteriorated since she gave birth to her first child last year. And she says, since he's been crawling, I'm on my hands and knees and it's hard. My body can't take it. It's been harder than I thought. My blood pressure has suffered and I get tired very easily now. I've seen several doctors, but they just give me medicines and a diet plan. The conversation surrounding elderly parenting through IVF often invoke the looming consequences of death for the newborn. Thus, concerns about the children's future after the inevitable and dangerously close death of the parents leads to questions about the aberrant nature of their desire as well. Uh, here I quote Dr. Narendra Malhotra, who is head of the Indian Society of Assisted Conception, who has said in a newspaper report, we don't endorse making mothers out of grandmothers. It's too risky for the woman. Their bodies are not designed to bear children after 50. Here are the monstrous commingles of the aberrant in creating an effective representation of overturning biological clocks. At the same time, the aberrant young couple who are unable to birth a child and who come to IVF clinics are not turned away. Oh, sorry. Um, so, yeah. They're often incorporated and pursued by IVF specialists as evident in the quote by Dr. Reddy that I mentioned earlier. Their absorption into fertility treatment despite unexplained causes of infertility such as issues with sexual compatibility or physical debility such as a missing uterus or a pinhole vagina or early menopause or a life-threatening disease nonetheless do not, do not invite retribution or horror. Here, debility is not inevitable or in progress, but in a state of unintended suspension. An aberration, but not a monstrosity. Their debility has social consequences that are not marked by death or immediate decline, thus requiring active intervention. But it is the 35 to 45 year olds who are the true normals of IVF treatment. They are abnormal in their delay of childbirth and marriage, but normalized in the quest and recourse to IVF. IVF is an inevitable aspect of declining reproduction marked by the age range identified above. Couples must prepare for entry into treatment even if they have birthed a child through sexual intercourse or normally, as they may come to suffer from secondary infertility. The discussion on secondary infertility presents interesting findings from the data gathered from the three sites. And it's actually kind of missing from the conversation on IVF, how there are lots of women who come to restore their fertility after it's supposedly gone or in decline. Gone, sorry. Uh, in Hyderabad, three out of 30 women had surviving children and were aged between 33 to 40 years of age. An overwhelming majority had no surviving children, though they may have suffered through miscarriages or stillbirths. In Hisar, out of the 31 individuals interviewed, six had previous children, mainly daughters, which points towards uh, the discussion on seeking sons through IVF. Again, the age range for seeking interventions for secondary infertility is between 35 to 42 years. In case of Hisar, the data is also particularly provocative as it documents visits to the IVF clinic to circumvent secondary infertility as much as to seek a son. In another paper that uh, I'm writing, uh, a, lot, a, a lot of the conversation around seeking a son after having daughters is positioned in this discourse of fantasy where so a lot of them who come to the clinic are post 50 and have lost their adult teenage son in an accident or through illness and they come to the doctor with and they have a surviving older daughter and they come to the doctor with images and uh, dreams of the fantastical where their diseased son visits them and tells them that he will come back again to her through her womb. So, and it works through going back to the doctor and seeking IVF because sexual intimacy is not part of the marital script anymore. And I'll come to that in the next section. Uh, a subsequent number of those who came for secondary infertility in Hyderabad, in Haryana and Hyderabad were women in the age bracket of 35 to 45 years and their normalization with an IVF was part of the treatment protocol. In Hyderabad, the sun preference was not as acute as it was in Haryana, largely due to the overwhelming culture of sex-selective abortions and female sex ratio in the north. Proven fertility was easier to work with five wave clinics as opposed to primary infertility, which was also associated with unexplained causes. 
Age thus becomes a maneuverable category that may be used to transfer infertility to fertility and vice versa, depending upon how the technology facilitates the birth of a baby. Yes, yet it is marriage and sexual compatibility that brings forth the most important linkages between age and fertility within assisted conception. So marriage, uh, I talk about how marriage and sex become markers of both temporality and a kind of uh, reproductive and a mapping of age and temporal inevitability within IVF. Um, the repeated emphasis on marriage and marital ties becomes a central trope in using and administering infertility medicine in India. The column in table two that highlights the years of marriage is also important in identifying the role that sexual intimacy plays in the birth of children. Thus, the number of years being married, uh, years of being married in case of the Hyderabad couples is less considering their age bracket, and that of the Hisar couples is longer. The ways in which age is constructed in assisted reproductive technologies comes to carry within it this paradox of marriage and the marital years that a couple share. Marital longevity and childlessness become potent tools in the hands of IVF specialists in claiming eligibility for using the technology. As per the WHO and Indian Council of Medical Research guidelines, the inability to conceive after years unprotected intercourse means that you are deemed infertile but eligible to use assisted reproductive technology. In a pro-natal culture like India, marriages must reproduce children and kin soon. The pressure to build families and kinship is intense within such, a, within such a cultural understanding, with many life cycle rituals embedded in childbirth, pregnancy, and motherhood. Due to the public outcry against the Hisar Clinic where I was working for facilitating birthing amongst elderly women, especially surrounding the birth of triplets by a 66-year-old woman in 2010, one of the babies died immediately after birth. And, uh, She's still alive and her two of her children are now nine years old. She was recently featured in a new spread. Uh, she looks very frail, but she seems very much alive and happy with her two children. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Rajesh, the IVF specialist at the clinic, had to reinvent the way he presented his clinic. There was a lot of bad publicity. For Dr. Rajesh, age was not an important factor. His focus was on facilitating the success of marriages that have remained true to the partners despite the debilitating impact that childlessness can have in terms of social stigma. In most of the publicity material that the clinic exhibited, successful couples who had children at the clinic were identified by the years of their marriage rather than their respective ages. I just want to show. Yeah, so if you, if you look at this image, these are all successful, but they're not identified by their age. And this is an advertisement that's on the website of the clinic and on the, at, at the clinic itself. They're identified in terms of their years of marriage. So the child is born after X number of years. Um, and most of, yeah. So Dr. Rajesh wanted to reward women, reward women who had been through years of social debility and abuse due to their childlessness by giving them the gift of a child born through IVF. The idea of marital commitment in the heterosexual marriage is particularly marked on the woman. In rural Haryana, infertility and childlessness are positioned on the woman as her lack. Ideas regarding a man's potency are never under scrutiny, though, the, though they may be talked of in whispers, if after more than two marriages, the man is unable to beget a child. Bigamy is commonly practiced amongst men in Haryana, especially amongst those who have been unable to have a child. In many cases, the wives facilitate the second marriage in open contravention of the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955, which penalizes bigamy. While in my sample, only two men had two wives, I had heard and read about multiple cases of bigamous unions undertaken due to an infertility. Here, the first wife would retain her position in the household as senior co-wife and div divorce was never an option, testifying to the importance of the marital bond or to the fact that everybody had a share in the property. Often the wife would suggest a young woman from amongst her natal kin as a suitable co-wife. 
Considerations of inheritance and spousal support were important in the choice of the second wife. Thus, one of my respondents, Sadhu, who had married his wife Rajo, who had married his wife Rajo's younger sister, after 15 years of childlessness, strengthened his ties with his final kin through the second marriage. Eventually, his second wife, Dhanu, who was in her 30s, was also unable to conceive, leading them to Dr. Rajesh's cleaning. Both underwent an embryo transfer. But it was Raju at 55 who conceived, surprisingly. She uh, had a daughter but relinquished care to her co-wife and sister Dhanu. Sadhu's 90-year-old mother spoke to me about the decision to seek a second wife for him. So here I quote uh, Sadhu's mother. We waited for Raju to get pregnant, but it was taking too long. Sadhu is my only son and we have all this land. He must have an heir. I told Raju, because Sadhu was refusing to marry again, she could choose her co-wife, a woman from her own family if that helped. And Raju would always be the first wife. Now look, look at God's will. Raju got pregnant before Dhan. It's actually very interesting how in case of a, a bigamous uh, union, uh, how the decision would be taken about who goes in for IVF. Does the older wife go in or the younger wife goes in? In most cases, the older wife was given importance. So she, she, often she would go in for, even though she's older, she would go for IVF before the younger wife who had a higher chance, if you look at the age uh, factor of getting pregnant. And um, uh, in many cases, like there's the 60 year, 66 year old woman who had triplets, her husband had married twice and none of his other two wives had got pregnant and they had eventually left him. And when she got pregnant, he actually told the media that old is gold. Uh, saying that he is, his first wife is the one who actually lived up to her reproductive potential and not the other two women he married. Um, Dr. Rajesh's intention was ostensibly to prevent such second marriages so that fertility was not compromised. He sold IVF as a feminist technology that protected women's rights within a marriage. And I quote him here, I support those marriages where the husband remains in love with his wife and does not remarry despite childlessness. There are many such men who remain committed after 30 to 40 years of marriage. They deserve IVF and I'm celebrating their love and support and not their age. The longer the marriage, the more suitable for IVF intervention. On the other hand, in Hyderabad, marriage and intimacy were under the scanner with many couples coming to the clinic within a year of their marriage. Often these couples were aged in their early, were, were in the uh, early to mid 20s. Here, the meaning of intimacy was marked by troubled associations with modernity and women's choices. The desire to reproduce was tainted by the failure of marriage itself. In Hyderabad city, couples did not seek intimacy, but children. Factors such as stressful work environments and schedules pushed many couples into the IVF clinic early into their marriage. All of the IVF specialists interviewed in Hyderabad city reiterated the impact lifestyle choices have on fertility. Excessive smoking, drinking, eating out, and hectic work schedules with the associated stress added to difficulties in conceiving, according to doctors. So one particular doctor uh, says, many of the couples who come to me for treatment work in information technology. This means they have demanding corporate jobs and grueling schedules. If both husband and wife are working till late, when do they have sex? On weekends. They have quick, disconnected sex on holidays which may not match with ovulation cycles and leads to zero chances of conception. Others mentioned increasing promiscuity as another reason for the collapse of conception within marriage itself. Sharmila Rudrupa is working on something uh, close to this in Bangalore amongst, against, uh, again, information technology professionals to look at the meaning of intimacy in, uh, in their personal lives. However, what is interesting to note is that in the Hyderabad data, out of 30 women, a majority of them around 20 were stay at home, while information technology professionals and other currently employed women were, were a minority. Similarly, amongst the 12 Indian men visiting the men's clinic for fertility treatment, three of them were in information technology, and the majority, around six of them, were in the services sector, including teaching and public service. The association with particular professions was also a trope the IVF specialists advertised, like Dr. Rajesh in his art. Damaging lifestyle choices that impact sexual intimacy over a long period of time 
were part of the larger narrative around women pursuing demanding careers who were, who were at a risk of infertility, while men pursuing supposedly hedonistic lifestyles were engaging on their role as responsible householders. Choice was an important trope when engaging with the question of marriage. So in case of uh, Southern India, the ethnographic work by Minna Savala looks at how uh, even in contemporary India, love marriages or choice marriages are not encouraged. Uh, there is a societal pressure, pressure to um, marry as per your parents' choice, which fits into community, religion, and caste. In fact, a recent survey amongst 20 to 30 year olds, university graduates and working professionals reiterated their desire to marry as per their parents' preference. So choice or love marriages uh, in Savala's research especially are looked down upon and stigmatized. However, in my fieldwork, um, love marriages became a very important support system for the woman who was going for infertility treatment because she's usually stigmatized within the family and in her relationship with, uh, in the joint family and with her husband. In an interview with the clinic counselor in Hyderabad, love marriages seemed to work better in the support that the woman got during infertility treatment from her spouse. This is especially potent in case of sexual intimacy. I quote the counselor here. See, unconsummated marriages make up almost 30% of the cases that come to me in the infertility clinic. Surprisingly, most of them are love marriages. I don't know, but in my experience, I've seen that in an arranged marriage, it is rare that husbands or wives will be understanding or will say, it's okay, take your time to have sex. Because an arranged marriage is an agreement where the spouses know close to nothing about each other and seek immediate parental intervention to solve any problem. Uh, in, in places like Telangana, parents are more involved in the lives of children. So either the wife goes and complains to her parents or the husband goes and complains and this is followed by both sides intervening. Uh, Pina Das uh, writes about it in her article on masks and faces in Punjabi kinship, where she says the lack of sexual intimacy in marriage often results in both parents coming in and counseling the couple to get on with it, basically. Um, sorry. Uh, when it comes to love marriage, during courtship, couples are comfortable and may try foreplay, but they still abstain till marriage. But after marriage, the lack of sexual intimacy continues. Most of the time, because they're comfortable and know that they love each other so much, they don't want to force each other. But there, but there is more to it than just love. Familial abuse or past episodes impact women's negotiation with sex and intimacy as well. In marriages arranged by families, this becomes exacerbated as couples know each other fleetingly before they marry. The familial pressure to birth soon after the marriage, along with the inability to do so, puts pressure on them. Here, uh, IVF is an easy resort to overcome the pressures of sexual intimacy. In interviews with, sorry, with young women frequenting IVF clinics in their 20s, many mention familial pressure as the main reason for visiting the clinic. Here, spousal support is a very important part of navigating the treatment in the face of stigma and social approbation. Yet, divorce due to infertility is not unheard of. Dr. Methali, had become trapped in a potential lawsuit when the husband suddenly refused consent to transferring embryos fertilized from his sperm and his wife's eggs into her uterus. Uh, she was mentioning this case to me. So she says, this man walks in and I can see something has changed in him. He says he wants out from the entire IVF procedure and wants a divorce. Suddenly, I don't know what happened. Earlier, he used to be very timid and his wife would openly berate him as being unmanly. I think when his test showed that he had a good sperm count, he regained some sense of his manliness. Of importance is the way in which assisted reproductive technologies continue to uphold heteronormativity as the ideal for marriage and fertility, while at the same time debunking its value through conflicting conversations on sexual compatibility and marital commitment. The temporal element of marriage compatibility comes to be positioned on their collective age as much as on the desire for procreation. I deliberately invoked quantitative and qualitative data in the interactions that age, aging, and marriage have in the conceptualization of a temporalization of intimate and procreative life. While we are cognizant of the value the time carries for intimacy and marriage, to engage with it through the prism of technology in the form of assisted reproductive technologies has been truly revealing. I have attempted to do this through the definitions that fertility and age carry in India with its regional and cultural variations, 
and similarities, as well as through the performance of medical diagnosis in making bodies in decline and through the heteronormative bond of marital commitment. Thank you so much. Shall we open the floor for some questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to go back to the, 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 the different categorizations that you have in different age groups, so aberrant but normal, abnormal, and then the monstrous. Yeah. Um, I just wondered to what extent the ability to produce or not produce eggs worked into that discussion. Because actually, if you think about it, the younger groups and the older groups, they're not having the same treatment. They're not all having IVF. Yeah. The older group are having egg donation, the younger group are having IVF. Yeah, so it's, um, is that erased? Is that brought to the fore? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, so there is a lot of there is a lot of information in the clinic, which is, uh, what is the word to you, whitewashed. Uh, for instance, in case of the senior uh, women who had children, Dr. Rajesh refused to tell me if they had egg providers. It was, it was of, I mean, I'm using the word obvious with all its, with caution, but it was obvious that they were not producing eggs anymore and that they had used uh, egg providers. But that was an information he just wouldn't give me. He just skirted that. Whenever I asked the couples, they would say, except for one or two women who said, yes, we had, we, uh, had an egg provider, who they had no idea about. The doctor chose the provider, did the entire procedure. They had no idea who the egg provider was. Most women, either they obviously knew, but they hid it as well. So like one particular woman who was in her 60s and was pregnant, seven months pregnant, said, no, I'm still bleeding. The doctor gave me some medicine and I'm bleeding. Uh, so it's my egg. It could be, this is rural India we are talking about. It could be, and I say it again with caution, it could be lack of information. Because in India, sexual and reproductive health is not talked about. Uh, young children are not given sex education. They have no clue. Half, half of the couples, as you know, have unconsummated marriages because they, some of them really don't know how to have sex. They have to be taught how to have sex because nobody tells them. So, but in case of the 20, 30 year old age group, which is in, in urban Hyderabad, uh, they are very aware of, you know, getting the role of the egg provider. And most of the women I interviewed were using the eggs, you know, till the last, point after which they couldn't. So the, the question of the egg provider was, they didn't want an egg donor. Mm -hmm. They were very, very sure about it. Mm -hmm. And they were young, so they couldn't make that choice. No, just to come back, yes, I absolutely understand that, and that's yeah. what we would expect. But I mean, in a sense, these things that you're showing us that show the years of marriage only make sense, or only sort of count in a, in a collusion with the idea that all these people are having the same treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you know, the years of marriage is yes. you know, not, not, not a measure of... Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and it's also, it's also inter interesting that many of the men might, there might be sperm donors involved as well. Because if a man is marrying thrice and not impregnating any of the women, but this is all done in the clinical space in deep secrecy. Uh, but thank you for that. I mean, yes, that is that is the subtext that I think I didn't bring out as well. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Anandita, for the talk. Fascinating as always. Um, I was quite taken by the quote of that doctor uh, who said, uh, as for him, IVF is a feminist technology securing rights of married women. So, uh, following up on that, I was wondering if you found anything regarding IVF's encounter uh, with the question of intimacy in the clinical spaces, because you just mentioned, and it's also my hunch that mm. a lot of these couples might not actually be doing it right. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so that, and also there are other issues which mm. affect intimacy and mm. all variety of intimacy. So 
Now, in a way, it's IVF instead of rescuing or being a feminist technology, even in the limited context, is it really actually threatening intimacy further? Mm. Because that becomes like an option of you. Mm. Yes. So I'm just wondering if, yes. if it, you found anything. I mean, it's, it's also a very sensitive topic. <laughs> Uh, sex within marriage, sex outside marriage itself is sensitive, but within marriage becomes even more so. But the little conversations we had, like for instance, uh, the counselor uh, who talks about unconsummated marriages, also, and it's a very problematic transcript that I went through where she says, uh, a lot of the men are gay, but are in the closet and are married, but will not, you know, will put the woman through that process when there's where there's no sex and the counselor said you know we just have to put them in the right place we just have to by marriage you know sometimes they are treated so marriage is both a treatment as IVF is a treatment for lack of sexual intimacy and in such situations IVF is great in case of uh, a lot of cases that were quoted involved women being abused by their fathers um, <coughs> their system shutting down for sex. So IVF, I, from what I understood, IVF, in some cases where people were having weekend sex, was definitely pushing intimacy out of the marriage. But in some cases was used, was a rescue for couples facing, you know, issues with sex and intimacy and togetherness. So, thanks. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I had a very quick look through your book. And my question really relates to what other options these couples uh, that you interviewed, and there are any records in, in the clinics uh, about the alternative of adoption, mm -hmm. um, and whether these, um, your sample, if any of you had considered that. Mm -hmm. I mean, after so and so many years of marriage, you might think that rather than having a very aged wife <laughs> and aged husband go through this process, whether they would have considered that and whether there might be any difference between the different areas, rural, urban couples. I would imagine the younger urban couples might have considered adoption because now I think it's more acceptable. Or whether there's some kind of patriarchal, biological kinship uh, ethos that would preclude the idea of adoption. I don't know, just to comment on that, because I see there was just one page in your book <laughs> where the adoption seems to be referred Well, I mean, thank you for that question, because adoption is, um, as Aditya Bharadwaj says, not an option in India. So adoption in India is um, primarily, even now, intrafamilial. But what has happened of late is that IVF has displaced adoption completely. In fact, there's a lot of newspaper reportage and in-depth analysis of how adoption rates are falling in India because couples would rather go for IVF than adopt. And um, interestingly, in rural Haryana, because most of the uh, couples were you know, coming from villages, many of them did adopt and they adopted their sister's children, but these children were always daughters because your siblings will not give you their sons. So you got daughters, they, had, they brought them to the clinic, but uh, they wanted a son. And uh, in fact, Sadhu, who I've quoted, who had two wives, he was taking his younger wife to the clinic for a son. And his younger wife didn't want a son. She said she was very happy with their daughter. But he told me, he said, you know, my daughter should have a home to come back to um, after she gets married. Because marriage itself is so problematic in rural India. So he said, if she, if she has a brother, she'll have a home to come back to. So there are different kinds of, there's of course patriarchy, biology, passing the wealth. But um, there's also this whole uh, final relationship. Access to information from, uh, from the, from the clinics, uh, pre and post uh, uh, the ban in India. Surrogacy ban. Yeah. yeah uh, 
it's been tough. <laughs> uh, it's been very tough, but uh, there has been a different side to it because a lot of a uh, lot of doctors and agents want to use researchers, and I use use researchers to as a lobby, uh, you know. So uh, in Hyderabad, I'm currently uh, helping out in a surrogacy agent, and I I go. She has a it's not a hostel; it's like a rented apartment where she has two or three surrogates. And uh, she's actually a very nice. Uh, she really takes care, and there. And she wanted. She was spoke to me to kind of you know lobby against the ban, uh, and write against the ban. But she's also she's now closed in shop. She said, you know, we can't go go on if the law is. But it's gone into review. So, but I had a lot of difficulty. I'm still. Nobody wants to talk about it in India anymore. So, thanks. How it used to be years ago, but adoption in other countries, such as the UK, is is not the same as trying to. Uh, it's I'm trying to find the right words about saying something that too unacceptable. But um, adopting UK children are children in care who have issues, so it's much more of a social parenting and social working rather than um, a, a normal parenting situation. Yeah. So um, I, I work in the IVF field, and we have a um, we get quite upset when people say, well, why don't people just adopt? Um, just adopt is, is really, really not uh, something in any country that it should be a phrase that those yeah. two words are put together. Um, but just um, regarding sex selection, so I, I worked on pre-implantation diagnosis for, for many years and was very aware that this then got banned in India. Mm -hmm. But do you think it still happens under current, especially now there's techniques such as the endocrine screening where you would do it for another reason, but you would know sex? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's all very covert, and but there's so many rumors in. I mean, the clinics I was working in, lots of couples said, you know, this clinic promises boys. Um, another clinic in Delhi, I went to this man in his thirties who had a daughter who's eight years old. Uh, said we have come here for a boy, and I'm paying X amount of money, and they're asking for Y amount of money, so I'm going to make sure that they give me a boy. And, but nobody's going to, you know, say it. But I also wanted to say something about the adoption thing. Just uh, so the recent, uh, and a colleague is working on this. Recent trends in adoption in India. The Central Adoption Resource Agency, CARA, Government of India, also has a social worker network. And in India now, a lot of single men and women are adopting, um, and they are they are adopting with great enthusiasm. And they're rescripting families in India. Of course, they're all urban, upper middle class, upper class. But um, a lot of them are gay, uh, but not out. So, like for instance, my colleague who himself is gay has recently registered uh, on the adoption agency website, and he has he's getting so many calls from single parents advising him. And he was told that do not ever tell the social worker that you're gay you will be crossed on the list. So just pretend that you're single and that you didn't get married. Even though there is no law or any kind of, anything that says that your sexuality uh, is part of the eligibility uh, to be an adoptive parent, but even then. So just wanted to know. Um, I just had a, uh, a question. I was wondering in, in relation to what was asked earlier about um, by Dana for by the egg donation, did you talk with the, um, the older people you spoke to about their understanding of fertility and um, whether they understood themselves to be fertile or not, how fertility related to the idea of marriage? And could you contrast that with the changes you've seen with the younger people, the egg freezing, for example, how they spoke about their fertility? Mm -hmm. So can you speak about um, the people you've interviewed, how, how the conceptualization of fertility has been changing or, or um, um, staying the same in different ways? Yeah. Um, the couples in Haryana uh, didn't know too much about the IVF process because they knew about sex and reproduction, but, but many of them, so the, their whole reproductive journey included before they came to IVF, which was much because many of them were in their 60s and didn't know about it until much later, involved local quacks, you know, local uh, doctors who would give them some vague medicine, or healers uh, who would ask them to worship certain gods, 
or um, you know folk medical techniques, diet, etc. Um, uh, but I remember this one particular woman telling me that she had she had been told she was struggling with fertility for many years in her marriage, and she was desperate. And she was told by someone that if you go to this particular village, there's a nurse who gives you an injection, which will make you pregnant. So she went, and the nurse basically told her, "Look, I'm going to put another man's sperm into you." Um, because your husband just, you know, we can't have kids. So I'm just going to, you're going to be pregnant, but I'm telling you right now, it's another man's sperm. And nobody will know, and it's, it's she refused. Uh, but that's, uh, she knew, she said, in Hindi, she, she told me, she said, you know, with the injection, she was going to put, she was basically going to facilitate sex with another man. Uh, but it's also interesting, this question of intimacy and fertility. When I was doing my research on surrogacy, I remember this surrogate coming out of uh, ET. And uh, uh, she, was, she was really upset. And she was lying in bed after the ET. And she said, you know, there were men in that room who looked up my vagina. And in some 20 years of marriage, even my husband has not looked at my vagina. And I felt completely devalued and my privacy was, was invaded like nobody's business. But I'm doing this for, so her husband was ill and needed money. She was doing it because she loved her husband so much and she was so committed to the marriage. So there's this uh, interesting thing. In case of the Hyderabad data, uh, they knew everything. They were very aware of the process. They asked, in fact, a lot of the IVF specialists in Hyderabad were complaining to me how, you know, these couples read up everything on Google and they come and they ask us so many questions. They have no idea what we are going through. And it is really painful to constantly answer their questions. But uh, they had the interesting thing here was that they, many of them didn't know how to have, have sex, but they knew everything about the IVF process. So uh, that's the paradox of the Haryana and Hyderabad. I, 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 I